Well, hello everyone. Glad to see everyone um, here for this this amazing conference. And uh, I think we should just, in um, true experiential ed form, just jump into something. And I am going to put in the chat a a link to a game that I'd like you all to click on and go and run through this. Um, a couple of things about doing this. Don't spend a whole lot of time thinking about it. Don't overanalyze what's happening. Just go through it and then we will have a discussion. Um, I'm gonna give everyone about five to seven minutes. So um, go oh. ahead and click on that and head out and... Um, Um, this is a, a, a fun and a, a quick way, uh, particularly if you're, you know, with, with students to kick off a class, Olga Hahn loves to do this as um, an opener and engage uh, with her class. Just, um, it's a way to kind of see who the, the greenies are in the class, who's more uh, profit driven. And um, this all came from a paper, I'll put the link in here, uh, that Olga Hahn and uh, Iwanis, Iwanu and Iwana Iwanis um, and uh, Rudolf Durand were doing some research and were talking with uh, Financial Times folks. They were interested in how to take data and research and make it more interactive and have a, a, a game component to it. Um, there are also some cases that were used for this. It doesn't reflect a, any particular uh, businesses, practices or anything like that, but it is a, um, a fun way to, to engage with, uh, with students and with others and um, start off some conversations. So I'll also include the questions that, um, Olga likes to, to ask to, to spark the conversation mm -hmm. after that. And if people want to, um, want to uh, discuss any of these, we can, we can go, go into that a little bit. Um, you know, so particularly what, what lessons did you take away? Um, I like the interplay of your personal ethical beliefs versus, you know, what, what's the, what are the goals for the, the company? So um, I'm going to stop talking and uh, see if anybody else wants to, to uh, make a comment or ask any questions about, about the game. Yes, Gaston. Uh, well, I, I think that you could probably have a very um, good discussion with students critiquing what they think is flawed and limited about the assumptions that appear to be implicit in the game. You know, for example, I was frustrated by the inability to uh, kind of engage in discourse with any of these groups. Uh -huh. Yep. And would it be fair also to say that the game mostly looked at trade-offs as opposed to synergies? Now, I mean, I quite like that because from a teaching point of view, particularly if you're teaching, um, people who've selected to be on your elective, you know, they will all come in and spout the synergies. <laughs> and sometimes there are synergies, but sometimes there aren't. So I, I, I mean, I, I quite like that feature of a game in a way, but is that a fair observation about that game? Yes, absolutely. So um, as the Center for Sustainable Enterprise, we, we don't like trade-offs. We want to see it, you know, the, the things that happen being for all of it, right? You're increasing your profit, you're doing better for the environment and for, and for society. So um, that, is, that is a frustration and something that um, even within the center, we have a lot of discussions about, about the trade-off uh, idea, so yeah. Yeah, I agree with uh, what was said uh, in a sense that yes, on the one hand, uh, you know, the uh, it it made sense to um, you know not to focus so much on the synergy, but at the same time, you know, like the word even the word long term development, 
you know, the long-term development being just reduced to R&D was very frustrating to me. And also, you know, social responsibility, for example, being reduced to a uh, charity donation and the, um, you know, and, and even the social and environmental and long-term being all in separate boxes, they were, they were, the, uh, you know, it was somewhat frustrating. So I, I, I feel that I agree with you that, you know, and, 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 um, and Gaston that, you know, like maybe it could be a great uh, conversation opener, like in a sense, like exactly precisely because the game is so incomplete. <laughs> oh, it, it yeah. can be a great conversation opener. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. What's the course that you mentioned that Olga uses this in? It's, is it, it's a, yeah. So it's a, it's a core course now and it's strategy and sustainability. So definitely very focused on her work in CSR mm -hmm. and um, yeah. It's, it's a core it's, course, so it's required for all, all MBA students now? That's... There's three courses in, it's, it's kind of a, an ethics uh, core and that's mm -hmm. one that students can, can choose right. to take. So I would say at least a third, possibly more students um, do take that, that course. Cool. cool. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah that was, sorry. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. No, go ahead. I was just sharing that I've used it. I teach an undergrad class in social entrepreneurship and I've used the simulation. It was an online class. So I used it in one of the discussion board, discussion post. And um, I get a mix of policy students and business school students, you know, so I think what discussion board allowed is like I made them screen based screenshots of the results. So what the discussion board allowed is like we could clearly see a difference between how the business school students responded and how the policy students responded. And so I thought that was a really great discussion to to compare results across the class. I can also paste the prompting questions that I've used in the chat. That's really interesting. Yeah. Yeah. It's sort of thinking about different student populations and how they respond and getting some of that data and making and making that visible back to the students. Right. Yeah. You could break it down by nationality, gender, like you could do kind of, I mean, you could be, you know, if you wanted to sort of shake things up. Yeah. Get into more granular mm -hmm. uh, ways to, of looking at it. Well, um, Cool. That was just a quick little opener, and I want to turn things over to the big fun that we're going to do now with, with Jason, and uh, we'll switch gears and go into the cool. simulation inroads. Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to um, show another, I mean, we're going to sort of play with another simulation together. Um, this is something that has, we've been developing at MIT Sloan and using in a lot of contexts, both outside the university engaging with policymakers and investors and executives, as well as sort of bringing it out into the curriculum at many different levels. So um, undergraduate, uh, grad, uh, master's executive levels. Um, and then, and then we, we collaborate with people who are bringing it down to the high school level as well. Um, so the, the tool that we're gonna end up playing with is called En-ROADS. Um, just by just kind of waving at me for a second, how many of you have seen En-ROADS before or played with it in some, some context? Okay, so a, a handful of you. Um, so the problem that we're gonna try to solve together is uh, no less than global climate change. Um, as you may be familiar with this picture, we, you are here. We've already warmed the planet one degree Celsius above pre-industrial levels. Um, and business as usual um, forecasts, which range from the 3.6 um, degrees and higher in Celsius by the end of the um, century, take us into this sort of purple zone of very high risks of severe irreversible impacts with limited ability to adapt. So we need to get ourselves from a future that is 3.6 degrees Celsius above pre industrial levels down to 1.5 degrees um, or two degrees, which is the, the targets under the Paris Accord in which scientists tell us will mitigate many of these very significant risks. Um, in order to do that, what we have to do is create dramatic reductions in our emissions. So a 3.6 degree um, business as usual involves continued increase in emissions globally um, whereas a two degree or 1.5 degree path involves significant reductions in emissions, decarbonization of the global economy. Now, um, of course, the Paris Accord set out these as this as a broad target, but the nationally determined contributions, the commitments that countries have made under Paris 
only add up to a three, um, enough reductions to get us to 3.3 degrees. So we've got to go a lot farther. Um, so that's kind of one challenge is that we have to marshal the sort of political will and understanding of what's going to solve the problem. The other critical challenge we have is, as John Sturman, my colleague, is fond of saying, the research shows that showing people research doesn't work. Um, and what we mean by that is that I can show, we can show all the great PowerPoint presentations and charts and graphs all day long, and it doesn't really change people's perspectives or understanding our mental models, let alone their willingness to take action. Um, what does make a difference is, um, is giving people a chance to learn for themselves by putting their hands on the system through simulation tools. Um, and we do a variety of different kinds of evaluation studies to look at how this kind of, these kinds of experiences increase people's sense of urgency, their willingness to take action, and their understanding of the climate system. Um, we've developed two computer simulation tools, C-ROADS and N-ROADS, um, and then these are embedded in a variety of different educational experiences, um, and we're going to play with, we're going to sort of do one, do one of these right now. Um, these tools are developed um, as a collaboration between MIT Sloan Sustainability Initiative, um, a cl Climate Interactive, which is an independent, nonprofit, nonpartisan organization, um, and the Climate Change Initiative at UMass Lowell, which um, where uh, Julia Rooney Varga does a lot of the evaluation, uh, leads a lot of the evaluation research. And the underlying data sources um, that are drawn on to do this kind of modeling come from a huge array of scientific um, studies um, and, and agencies like the IPCC and the IEA. Um, and the models are free and accessible to everyone with a web browser. Um, they're transparent and open source in a sense. All of the equations are visible, all the assumptions are visible, and, and you can change the assumptions yourself as a user. Um, they're calibrated to behave the same as the big supercomputer models, uh, the integrated assessment models against a full range of scenarios. Um, but they're ag it's highly aggregated, so it runs fast, instantaneously in a browser. Um, so road stands for rapid overview and decision support, and the idea is that that sort of rapid experience. Um, and so that is what um, that's kind of what this, these tools allow. And what we've been doing is a full court press to bring this out into the world to shape um, climate action globally. Um, so over a hundred elected officials, two hundred staffers. Um, Republicans, Democrats here in the United States, um, senior officials in Japan and other, other countries around the world, the whole Biden administration, um, business leaders. I lead the part of engaging with investors around these tools um, and, and, and bring it out into higher ed. And, and one of the things that I'll, I'll talk about a little later is that any of you can become an En-ROADS ambassador and learn how to facilitate these experiences yourself and then bring those into your context um, and others in your faculties can do so as well. Um, so what we're going to do is so, so the, 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 we're, we're going to experiment and explore this Android simulation tool. And so the first thing I'm going to do is I want to ask you, um, what do you think is going, what actions are going to help us limit warming to no more than, um, 1.5 degrees Celsius. So in the chat for the zoom. Um, I want you to just everyone just share like, what do you think? What kind of action is going to help us move the fastest toward uh, toward a, a better climate future? And just paste like whatever your favorite climate solutions are into the chat. Great. Well, Allison, reduce deforestation. Tracy says carbon tax. Um, no coal, less gas, population reduction, moving energy production out of coal, no meat, invest in renewable energy, cut meat consumption, reduce energy consumption. Fantastic. So there's a whole bunch of different ideas that are percolating up here. Um, business model change across the value chain, afforestation, reduce new forestation, nuclear. So uh, the, the, the idea here is that if I'm a policymaker or an asset owner and I'm trying to decide how to allocate my attention to solve these problems, I've got this much attention bandwidth, and I'm using it to think about everything, COVID recovery, um, racial justice, uh, voting rights. I've got about this much of my bandwidth to think about the environment. We've got we've water got issues, soil issues, air pollution issues. I've got about this much time to think about the climate. And within that band of my attention, I've got all of these different ideas coming my way, and all of them sound about equally good. 
So how are we going to make a discernment between these different um, climate possibilities, these climate action possibilities? And that's really what the En-ROADS tool is designed to do. I'm gonna paste the link to it into the chat. So those of you who are like chronic multitaskers can play with it yourselves, but I'm gonna keep sharing screen so we can look at this all together. So if I look at what you guys all said in chat, um, you know, kind of the modal answer here is, um, let's see. Okay, this is actually a pretty good spread across all of these. Um, I see um, invest in renewable energy, switch to renewables, move to green energy. So let's start with that. Um, let's see what happens if we increase renewable energy. Um, so I can do that by just pulling this slider um, under these three dots, there are detailed settings for all of these things. So if I'm pulling this slider, what I'm doing is I'm adding a subsidy for renewable energy and I can kind of crank that up. There's also other forms of encouragement of renewable energy like uh, storage costs and so on, so on. But let's encourage renewable energy and see what happens. Um, now I'm gonna, before I pull this slider, I want you to form a hypothesis in your mind about what number, what number, if I, if I pull a, a very dramatic renewable energy subsidy that is synchronized all around the world, what kind of change are we gonna see in temperature? What is that future, what is, what are we gonna, is it gonna be 3.6 going, coming down to what number? So form that hypothesis in your mind and I will pull the lever now. Okay, so that's a, a, a subsidy for renewable energy. Let's see if what happens if I can pull it even higher, a super high subsidy, we get from 3.6 down to 3.4 degrees. Um, that's equivalent to a three cent per kilowatt hour subsidy. Um, raise your hand just visually, was that a smaller change than you thought it was going to be? Okay, was it a bigger change than you thought it was gonna be? Raise your hand. If it was about what you expected, raise your hand. Okay, so pretty good spread across the across the board there. Um, so the question is, well, why don't we see a bigger change out of this uh, renewable energy? Solar is sort of the symbol of climate action. Why don't we see a bigger change? Well, what we can do is we can use these graphs to sort of explore and, and, and understand why. So if we look very closely, and what I can do is I can add that change and I can use these buttons to sort of repeal and add the change back is what we see is that we're expanding renewable energy. It is partly substituting away from, from, from the coal, oil, and gas that we had on the grid. Um, it is also, subsidizing energy makes it a little bit cheaper. We're also slightly increasing our overall energy use, although not much um, of a rebound effect. Um, and as a result of that partial substitution, we have this reduction in energy CO2 on the right, and a reduction in temperature that results from it. But we're still burning a lot of coal, oil, and gas all through the century. And so that's still gonna add a lot of carbon. So let's look at other ideas that have popped up here. Um, somebody says, uh, reduce energy consumption, that, that should, house efficiency, energy efficiency. So a few of you are saying, let's just use less energy. Um, so we can play with that here. There's two different ways we can play with energy efficiency. One is in stationary energy, so buildings and industry energy use, and the other is in transportation. So let's let's make our our buildings and energy our buildings and industry more energy efficient. Again, for my hypothesis, what number are we going to see when I pull that lever? And now I'll do that. Okay. So that got us another two tenths of a degree. And what you can see is the mechanism of action here is that it reduces the height of this graph on the left side. It takes us from um, using a total of about 1300 exajoules a year globally down to um, 800. So there's a lot less um, coal, oil, and gas that we have to burn in order to produce that energy. Um, some of you may have meant by energy consumption also work on transportation. So let's look at if we also reduce transportation energy use, we can try that. And then that's going to also, that's going to get us another two tenths of a degree. So we got four tenths of a degree actually out of the combination of these energy efficiency moves. So that's a really interesting insight, right? Is that, is that reducing energy use stops the coal, oil, and gas from burning right now um, in a way that actually got us a bigger de delta than we did by subsidizing renewable energy. Now, both are useful, but that's, that got us to this 3.0 degree level. So excellent. Now, we've got other things that people have suggested here beyond just the energy system. So there's a couple of people who said reduce meat consumption. Why do we want to reduce meat consumption? By the way, I'm going much, much faster than I do in a normal sort of classroom session here, just because we're in limited time and, and we want to get to the sort of meta discussion about how we use these in the classrooms. 
but let's, but, but I, um, so a couple, few of you have said cut meat consumption. Cutting meat consumption, people usually say that's a good idea for two reasons. One is that it reduces methane from um, cows, lamb, and other um, uh, enteric fermenting animals. So we can play with the methane slider here. And people, and it also eat, eating less meat tends to result in less land being used for agriculture because it takes about 10 times as much um, cal 10, 10 calories, 10 plant calories to produce one calorie of, of beef. Um, and so that smaller use of land will put less pressure on forests. And so it'll give us a little bit of benefit in terms of deforestation. So if we let's let's look at the package of those two interventions. First, let's look at the deforestation component. So let's say that that reduction in meat consumption results in a, 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 a modest decrease in deforestation. Um, there's other pressures on forests beyond, beyond just meat cultivation. So um, I'll click it about to this level. Again, form a hypothesis about what we're going to see. And then I'll click the lever. OK, so that got us another tenth of a degree. And the way you can see that is in this graph, this green band of land use CO2 has gone from being a net source of emissions to being pretty close to zero by the end of the century. So we've pretty much slowed down and stopped the process of deforestation by the end of the century. Um, and that got us a tenth of a degree of difference. Um, now, some people, so raise your hand if that was a smaller change than you thought it was going to be. OK, so many of you say that. Um, in fact, um, I do a lot of work with this tool with investors, with high net worth families and other private wealth owners um, and other climate investors. Oftentimes, forestry is one of the first things people want to go to. They say, let's plant a trillion trees. Let's stop deforestation. Um, and, and in fact, some of you said um, afforestation and reduced deforestation. That was Divya's, that was Divya's suggestion. So um, let's plant some trees. Um, and let's, let's go into the detailed settings here about. Um, and so when we're pulling the planting trees, we're going to say, what percentage of available land that we could possibly use to plant trees on will we actually plant trees on? So let's go for a really ambitious tree planting initiative. And we put, let's say, half of the um, half of land that's available for forestry globally into, this is sort of a trillion tree scale type initiative. So let's see what that does. Um, what that does is that gets us another 10th of a degree. No, sorry, not quite. It gets us a 10th of a degree Fahrenheit, which is a finer, finer grain temperature. We're putting away about three gigatons of carbon every year, which is fantastic. But there's just this kind of challenge about scale, which is that we're putting away three tons of uh, carbon into these forests um, at the same moment that we're emitting 26, 27 tons from our energy system, five gigatons of CO2 equivalent in F gases and methane and everything else. Um, now, originally, we were talking about reducing meat consumption. So let's look at methane. Um, methane, we can break out separately the agricultural um, and waste emissions, so, so this kind of beef reduction, rice cultivation change, et cetera, versus the energy and industry emissions of, CO, of CH4, so um, industrial processes that give off, particularly fertilizer manufacturing that give off these gases. So let's play with reducing our agricultural and waste emissions of methane and nitrous oxide through a big push on uh, reducing meat consumption. So let's see what happens if I click right about there. OK, that was worth 2 tenths of a degree with that change. And now that you're starting to calibrate your expectations, you can say, oh, that's, that's pretty good. We got more change out of that than we got out of all of the forestry work. Um, and that's because methane is a very strong greenhouse gas, 20 to 30 times stronger than CO2, depending on the time horizon that you look at it on. And so we're getting the reduction here of this light, um, this light blue band of, and the stark blue band of, uh, of, of nitrous oxide emissions. So now we're, 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 we're coming closer to the two degree mark, but there's still well, we still have a ways to go. Now, um, uh, so I'm going back to the chat here to see what other ideas that we might have. Um, now, uh, let me go to, actually, before I go to any more ideas, let me just quickly respond to Anna's question here. Anything that allows us to see the impact of biodiversity. So, this is a really important caveat is that is that this tool draws our attention to thinking about greenhouse gases and greenhouse gases um, alone, in a sense. There's a lot of other great reasons to stop deforestation and plant trees. We're creating habitat for animals, for plants, for fungi, for possible 
uh, for all kinds of human use and for its own sake. Um, and so there's a lot of really good reasons to do that. Um, we just have to be realistic about the carbon impacts. Um, we can look at some other impacts of our choices here. So we've been focusing on temperature change and greenhouse gases. Um, we can also look at sea level rise. We can see how many meters of sea level rise do we end up with by end of century in the current scenario. We can look at air pollution from energy. I think this is a really fascinating graph. So this is PM 2.5 air pollution that's responsible for millions of deaths globally, um, uh, particularly in India and China, um, who have ramped up very significantly coal capacity. Um, I'll just rewind one change here. The energy efficiency in buildings and industry probably had the biggest change there because coal, um, coal fired power plants are the largest source of that um, PF 2.5 air pollution. So we've already reduced air pollution. We've, we've saved a lot of lives. We've probably paid for a lot of these changes already just by virtue of those, those improvements. Um, we can look at ocean acidification. As the tool of, uh, continues to evolve, we're gonna be looking at more and more of these, um, of these different uh, impact graphs. Um, but, uh, but for now, those are the ones that are available. Um, so, um, so let's keep going with the, with the other ideas. So a couple of other things. So someone says population, Farley number says population. Okay, so Farley's playing Thanos today. Um, but the, actually we don't have a Thanos button. What we have here is ethical population um, is uh, changes in, in future population. So if the UN median forecast is that we're gonna end up with 11 billion people in the world, um, and what I can do is I can actually break this down to look at population by region. So we can see um, India, China, other developed countries, other developing countries, um, US, EU. Um, if I pull this lever down, what we're gonna do is go to the low end UN forecast, which basically is um, about uh, reproductive uh, health access and education, um, economic opportunities for women, uh, in emerging markets, things that tend to lower the birth rate in very high birth rate locations um, in ethical and socially productive ways. So let's see what that does if we go for that, um, for that change. So what you can see is the main effect there was on our um, other developing country emissions, um, and that got us about a tenth of a degree of temperature change. That tends to be smaller than people anticipate. It has to do with the fact that the biggest changes are in emerging markets who aren't heavily industrialized, don't have very high per capita emissions anyway. Um, and so it doesn't end up having as big of an effect as, um, as, as some people might anticipate. Um, so there's a few other things that we might want to do. I never play this game with people on, uh, without getting to two degrees because I think it's really important to show that these futures are possible. Um, so let's keep, let's keep going with what we've got. Hugh Wilson says no coal less gas. Okay, so let's look at no coal. What does no coal mean? Well, there's a lot of different ways we can go after no coal. Um, we can apply a tax per ton of coal. Um, we can apply a, uh, we can change the uh, utilization of coal uh, in, in, mixed, um, in mixed source power plants. My favorite button is stop building new coal infrastructure. So this could be achieved through a global moratorium in this year's Glasgow COP26. It could be achieved through capital markets and investors agreeing not to provide any new incremental capital to coal-fired power plants. Um, it could happen through um, a covenant between US um, and uh, Ch uh, China and Japan who are responsible for a lot of um, uh, uh, development internationally. So let's stop building new coal infrastructure and see what happens. Okay, that's going to get us another tenth of a degree. And if we look at our uh, uh, air pollution impacts that we were playing with before, that change is going to make is going to save a lot more lives as we um, shut off that coal infrastructure. So that that's gotten us that's gotten us a couple of um, sort of social co benefits along with the um, along with the reduction in greenhouse gases. Of course, now we will always want to be when we think about from an equity perspective. We always want to be thinking about what is this doing to people's energy costs? Um, how much are we having to spend on energy? Right now, we're doing really well because um, our energy efficiency measures have meant that we're that overall we're spending less on energy than we would have on the in the baseline, uh, which is fantastic. Uh, but we should be monitoring this in case we're going to do something else. Um, you know, other things like carbon pricing and and, and things which might increase our uh, energy prices. 
so we've we've uh, we've taken a we've taken a stab at turning off the um, coal. Um, we, there was also a move to say, well, let's do less natural gas so we can maybe tax some of that natural gas. We can go after natural gas through a tax like this. Um, interestingly, doesn't make a huge change. Um, and um, and of course, it, it's going to increase some energy prices, will pr produce some revenue for governments. One of the things that actually does make a dent in coal, in oil and gas that people don't often think about is that we use a lot of gas for heating. Um, and so if we can electrify our buildings and industry, that's going to tend to allow us to move away from um, gas as well. And that electrification, if done ambitiously, can get us as much as two tenths of a degree. So now we're in the, now we're starting to get to a future where we are in spinning distance of 2.4 degrees. We have a predominantly renewably powered grid. Um, one thing we haven't done is 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 uh, Tesla's for all. Um, I think there was one comment that said, um, uh, "Let's see, no, nobody nobody's made that move." But I'm going to go ahead and just use facilitator's privilege here and do that. Um, electrification of transportation will tend to shift from oil into grid-based electricity sources. Given that we've moved towards pretty good um, green energy on the grid, we're going to get some benefits out of that electrification. We would see less benefit if we were still uh, running a lot of coal plants. Um, and then Allison says, can you speak a bit about how economic growth impacts this? That's a fantastic question. Um, one of the views here is the Kaya graphs, which allows you to say, okay, population times economic growth times energy intensity of, of GDP times carbon intensity of energy equals total CO2 emissions. Um, so when we play with our population graph, you can see how that changes this left, um, the leftmost piece, and then that ends up changing our total energy use. Similarly with economic growth, we can play with different economic growth forecasts. Right now, we have long-term economic growth of 1.5% per year. Um, in the current scenario, it's actually lower than the baseline because um, of some of the uh, changes we've made to the, the uh, I believe that's the taxes that are driving that. Um, but let's, let's do some experimentation. But just, just, to, just to answer your question, Allison, if we reduce um, economic growth, that is reducing GDP per capita, um, and that's going to end up reducing our overall um, energy use and therefore CO2 emissions. But of course, you know, there's a lot of countries in the world that are still needing to grow. So we want to think about how that economic changes in economic growth are going to be allocated, but that certainly could be a piece of the puzzle. Um, so the so this so anyway this is this gives you a view onto uh, this tool. One a couple of other things um, just to say about how the um, how the uh, how the tool works. The scenario here is the URL. So if I copy and paste the URL here into the chat, you can pick up exactly where we left off. Um, it also means that I can just open up a fresh browser tab and say. Okay, we've been adding a lot of these um, act climate actions on top of one another. Um, let's see what happens if we do things in isolation. So I can say, well, what happens if we just um, stop building new coal plants? Well, that by itself is worth three tenths of a degree if it's the only thing we do. What happens if we just do energy efficiency in buildings and industry? That's also worth about three tenths of a degree. What happens if we just plant the trees, right? That's worth about a tenth of a degree. So it's often useful to have two of these um, uh, explorations going at once. Um, I'll just say, you know, we haven't really played with carbon pricing. Uh, we can do that. We can add a carbon price. Um, and that's probably going to get us across the finish line to, to two degrees. Um, in the current scenario, that's a $68 price of carbon. You can ramp it in slowly if you want to give the economy more time to adjust, um, which is a really nice experiment to try. And you can see what that does on your own time to, uh, to the uh, energy costs. So oftentimes what, I, what, we, what I'll do getting to this point of two degrees is say, take a deep breath. Let's take, take a look at this picture and ask yourself the question, what would you love about getting to be part of this future? What would you love about getting to be part of this future? And you can answer that question in chat.
really take it in. What does this mean? We've just reached two degrees with no technological miracles. I didn't pull the nuclear fusion lever to give a breakthrough in low carbon and zero carbon energy. I didn't pull the technological carbon removal lever to suck CO2 out of the atmosphere. There are no magical technological breakthroughs and we got to two degrees. So what you just experienced, I'm gonna go, okay, this is beautiful. I love getting these, um, these, uh, these, these responses in chat. I'm gonna go meta here for a second. What you just experienced is something that we call um, the En-ROADS climate simulation or what we sometimes call policy testing. Um, so um, this, is, this is this pattern of, I ask, you know, you suggest things, I try them on the model. Of course, you can imagine doing this in a live session. I could have you shouting out the answers. That's what we do with the senators. Um, in, I've done this with 600 person webinars in those contexts. What I'll do is I'll use a poll everywhere tool. Um, I do, a, I have a clickable image poll where, um, where anyone can literally just tap on the lever that they want to pull and I'll get a count of how many people have suggested that particular lever. And then we can sort of by voting, um, pull the levers that people are asking for. Um, so it scales from two people to, you know, thousands um, at a time. My record is 600, but um, uh, that's what's called the, the En-ROADS climate simulation. And we're just iteratively learning about how the climate system works. Um, there's a second assignment called uh, the guided assignment or the solution search. And that one, I put you in breakout rooms and each team gets the, their hands on the model and your job is to get to two degrees. And your job is to not just get to two degrees, but to write up the scenario, what would actually have to happen in the world in order for that scenario to come to pass? And what would the co-benefits be from a social equity perspective? What might be some of the costs from or, or harms from a social equity perspective? Justify that scenario. And there's um, we have all kinds of materials on the web to guide um, the En-ROADS guided assignment is available on the website as a, um, as a resource. And the Climate Interactive website is phenomenal with just chock full of resources for educators. The third format that we use is called the climate action simulation. So in that one, I'm wearing a suit. I am Antonio Guterres, the Secretary General of the United Nations. I've put every one of you into different interest groups. Natalie, you're the CEO of the fossil fuel companies. Jean Baptiste, you're the uh, you're the um, the president, the premier of China. Gaston, you're Donald Trump. Mark, you are the land and agriculture forestry companies, and we negotiate. So you have to propose an action, and I'll make a small change in the in the sliders in response to your action. But another group might repeal your action, um, and so it, we have to go. We go through rounds of negotiation about which sliders we're going to pull. The people in the room simulate the social political dynamics. The computer simulates the techno-economic and climate dynamics. Super fun, can't be done in less than three hours, but we've done it with everyone from, um, again, elected officials to investors, to executives, to every executive MBA student, every Sloan fellow, most MBA students. Um, we're gonna try to get to half of MIT undergrads this fall. Um, so super fun experience. Um, the C Roads tool, which is the other tool I mentioned, is more of a national um, climate um, uh, goals tool. So this lets you play with, well, what happens if countries reduce emissions in particular years by particular rates? So this simulates the kind of negotiation that will happen in COP26 or that happened at the Paris Accord. Um, there is a guided assignment for um, C Roads as well, and a model UN style negotiation game where, where the countries have to negotiate with each other about what their um, greenhouse gas targets are gonna be. Um, and all of these games and experiences are, are documented on the, uh, on the Climate Interactive web, website. Um, so, uh, you know, again, I, I would suggest getting to be a En-ROADS ambassador. There's an online training process, it's all free. Um, to learn how to do, how to moderate and facilitate, how to learn the model dynamics. Um, and we encourage everyone to do that. So that is the uh, En-ROADS tool in as fast as I could do it. And I think we have 10 minutes now to kind of step back and talk more generally about how we use simulations in our 
classrooms, in our co-curricular work, and in galvanizing the various communities that we are responsible for mobilizing on climate and sustainability. So questions, comments on, uh, on, on En-ROADS or more generally this topic of simulation-based learning. So Anna raised her hand, Anna. Okay. Yeah, um, uh, I, I just, yeah, thank you so much, uh, first of all, for, for the presentation, it was, it was amazing. And I'm, I'm kind of trying to venture into this territory despite my lack of uh, technological skills, et cetera. And I've been actually considering fish banks, so uh, the good and old fish banks uh, for my class. And I yep. was wondering, like, you know, I'm, I'm loving the, um, the inroads uh, tool as well. And, you know, the little exercise at the beginning. And I was just wondering whether you had some, any of you had some experiences of uh, using multiple simulation tools, you know, together um, in the same course and, and whether you have any advice about, you know, how to use uh, certain tools in certain, for certain audience or kind of, I don't know, maybe perhaps not doing too much, but kind of having a right mix, so to speak. And if any of you have one experience. I mean, I, I can just say quick. So, fish banks, um, you know, also an MIT Sloan tool. Um, the the um, there's an educator site that will help you um, kind of get into that game as well. Um, in our flagship sustainability course for master's level students, we do both fish banks and the Enroad simulation game. Um, we use them at sort of different parts of the semester. Um, we use um, fish banks to act for sort of early on in the semester to kind of illustrate basic overshoot and collapse limits to growth concepts that are sort of foundational to our systems approach for thinking about sustainability. And then we use En-ROADS later on in the term when we're thinking about um, uh, uh, cl climate and corporate political activity. Uh, because many of those sliders that you pull, you can think of them as companies moving, you know, renewable energy, you could say, I'm pulling renewable energy because companies are all setting 100% renewable energy targets. But many of them require some sort of public policy action. So when we talk about corporate political action, we sort of use this array of things um, and the simulation experience, the, the role playing game experience to give people a feel for what it means to be a political actor as a company. Thank you so much. That's very helpful. We Mark, use it in a, in a number okay. of, of different courses uh, in MBA as well as undergrad. And it just, um, it really depends on what your goals are and how it fits into your your course structure and I, um, I we, we did this with an alumni group which was a lot of fun and uh, you know it, it can be used in a lot of different contexts and uh, I think it just you know you need to fig figure out like where it best fits thank you Mar Marcus yes thanks to both of you first of all for this great presentation it's really fun I just wanted to know, I put it in the chat, Jason, maybe you can quickly say when you have the GDP population calculations, is that linked in any way to the world models that the group uh, John was also involved and um, Dennis Meadows are using? So the, um, so the way that we do it in En-ROADS is that there's a, um, the, we don't close all those, we don't, well, we, we, part, we just closed some of those feedback loops. So we don't close any feedback loops to population. So we don't have any like, you know, decline in population as a result of climate related harms. Um, we did just add in, so if you go into the assumptions, so you go simulation and then assumptions, um, then you'll see that there is a economic impact of climate change um, op option here. Um, so if I reset the simulation, and so we're going to a 3.6 degree world. What I can do is I can choose from the different economic damage functions that close that feedback loop. So if I go for the Nord House, which is a very conservative assumption, um, you know, economic growth isn't really dramatically affected by, um, let me pull this up. Uh, so here's, um, this shows you how um, e GDP is affected by temperature in these different models. So if I do, the, if I use the Dietz and Stern set of assumptions, which is an increasing function of economic damage, then you'll see that actually there's sort of this self-limiting overshoot and collapse that's happening even without any policy response. So there is a closed feedback loop to economic growth, um, which, uh, and we think the Dietz and Stern assumptions are more realistic, 
but the point is that you can choose those for yourself because there's enough we've essentially codified things into the model wherever there's scientific consensus and then whenever there's scientific disagreement we sort of make it more of an option to explore and experiment with in the assumptions we have really really good success with this tool with republican lawmakers and other conservative and skeptical people because we let them play with their with the assumptions and say okay you think the climate system isn't as sensitive to co2 fine pull that down and and then and then work from those assumptions and they all the defensiveness goes away because they see that we're not there to sell them something it's an exploration um and so that's kind of a general and, and some of these these feedback loops to um to limits to growth are sort of fit into that category okay Arpita? thanks a lot cool and uh, Arpita yeah. has yeah thank you uh, thank you for a great presentation. And uh, this was my first exposure to this particular simulation tool, and I really loved it. Uh, now, my question is that uh, I teach sustainable finance, and I'm pretty keen on taking this over uh, to the financial module. So do you have any resources specifically from investors point of view or from uh, you know like the pension funds point of view yes. and the banks point of view yes um i do um that's the project that i'm leading right now is to um is to sort of customize enroads for the investor audience so there's a couple of things that we're doing one is that when you go we're, we're at it, we haven't added it yet but we're going to be adding a piece which is if you if you, in the in the um if you go into detailed settings for any of these I, for any of these items and you click this information button, you get a lot of documentation about what these things mean, what the key dynamics are, the equity considerations. Would there will be um, a a a uh, a header under all of these documentation that says investor considerations or investor actions, and it okay. will have examples of investor actions and case examples related to every one of the um, sliders. And then in addition, um, I have slides that are that I use um, associated with my presentations of this that um, that's again that, that explore how investor actions change the world in such a way that pulls the sliders. Um, and then and then and then and then I we explore the sort of common mental models that people have about sustainable investment and when it does and doesn't actually affect the climate. Um, and try to orient people more towards this engaging for transition corner of the picture mm -hmm. where they tend to want to focus more on the, the one of these two. So, mm -hmm. um, so that's, um, that's, so, so there we, I do have some supplemental materials and if you email me, I can share them with you. Sure. Thanks. Thanks. I will, I'll just say as a as sort of a close, since we're heading the end of the uh, end of the hour here, I'll just say as a closing word, I mean, the most fun I have teaching is use teaching this with simulations. I teach fish banks, um, you know, half a dozen times a year and and roads about every two weeks. And, um, and, you know, the level of engagement, the level of eyes open awake, there's, we have a phenomenal um, video actually, of high school students during a lecture about climate change and then during the game and you just see everybody like completely wake up and become inspired and the research um, the evaluation research on this um, shows this well so i i'm for packing as many simulations into a semester as as you can it always ends up being the thing that people remember and come back and and say five years later that um shape and we've seen people completely redirect their career trajectories as a result of these experiences in a way that um, you know doesn't doesn't happen with other types of pedagogy. Yep, I will I will back that up. Uh, Drew Jones, who is with Climate Interactive, teaches systems thinking for sustainable enterprise at Keenan Flagler, and um, Keenan Flagler has kind of been the um, the the testing ground for the teaching component of this over time, and exactly. it has really changed a lot of students what they're focused on, what they end up doing with their careers. And it's, uh, it's been phenomenal um, having real data to, to work with and for them to pull levers and see what happens. It's just, you, you, can't, um, you can't do any better than that. So rec highly recommend uh, incorporating these into your, into your curriculum.
Well, we're reaching the end of our time. So please join me in thanking Jason and Tracy for this amazing hands-on understanding of both of these simulations. Um, really, really wonderful. What a great takeaway for all of us.